On February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah, Gary Ridgway, infamously dubbed as the Green River Killer, was born. He was given this alias by the media upon the discovery of his first five victims in Utah's Green River. For a long period, he served as a painter for a truck company. He was raised by Thomas Newton Ridgway and Mary Rita, his parents. He had two siblings named Gregory and Thomas Edward. He was married three times in total. From the year 1970 to 1972, he was first hitched to Claudia Craig Barrows, then to Marcia Lorene Brown from 1973 to 1981, and finally to Judith Lorraine Lynch between 1988 and 2002. He had just one son, Matthew. Ridgway was deemed guilty of 49 separate charges between 1982 and 1998, potentially as recently as 2001. Based on verified cases, he became the second most prolific serial criminal in U.S. history. Since his prostitution-related arrest in 1982, he has been a person of interest in multiple cases. However, at that time, authorities were unable to prove that. Nevertheless, his involvement remained unproven until 2001, when developments in DNA technology enabled investigators to match the DNA from his saliva sample taken in 1987 to the unidentified male DNA recovered from the bodies of multiple victims. On November 30, 2001, he was apprehended while departing from his place of employment at the Kenworth Truck Factory in Renton, Washington. When Ridgway was taken into custody, more than 10,000 pieces of collected, documented, and preserved evidence were ready for trial, said Dave Reichert of the King County Sheriff's Office. Investigators discovered at the time that he was not very accurate in connecting dump sites to the remains of victims he disposed of there. He led the task group to the bodies of three more victims thus far, and he had been wrong about two of the victims' identities. He entered guilty pleas in 48 crimes in 2003 and his 49th case in 2011. He was given a life term without the chance of release on December 18, 2003. He took a plea deal, by the terms of which he was spared of execution in which he pledged to provide the whereabouts of the remaining missing women. He's serving his time at the Walla Walla, Washington State Penitentiary. It was said that the majority of Ridgway's victims were prostitutes and other women in vulnerable states such as underaged runaways. The ages of his victims ranged from 14 to 38. In a confession, he claimed that he picked prostitutes as his victims because he knew they would not likely be overlooked. One of the prosecutors assigned to the case, Patty Eeks, said she was still concerned about Ridgway's absence of remorse when he finally admitted to slaying those women. She claimed that Ridgway appeared to be a typical middle-aged naive man. Because of his pleasant demeanor, some victims might have felt comfortable getting into his truck. I believe he looked for females who were vulnerable. He had this weird underlying desire of feeling like he had a beautiful woman by his side. Most of the time the women that he picked up were attractive. He wanted to be one of those people who would say, I have a gorgeous woman with me. It wasn't something he had felt that he had in his personal life. Physical attractiveness was undoubtedly a factor, she stated. Ridgway took the officers to the sites along the Green River where he buried one of his victims. Twenty-three human bones and teeth were discovered there on August 21, 2003, and were simply designated as Bones 20. After two decades through analysis of DNA gathered from the skeletal remains, Othram successfully identified the victim as Tammy Lyles in 2023. The CEO of Othram, molecular biophysicist and genetics expert David Middleman, stated that the DNA was in poor condition, degraded. Based on the sample, the company proceeded to create a new DNA profile. Authorities reached out to her mother, and through her reference sample, researchers were able to identify Tammy. On April 23, 1985, Tammy's skull and additional remains were discovered at the Tualatin Golf Course close to Tigrad, Oregon. Using Tammy's dental records, it was identified in March 1988. When her family buried her in the 1980s, according to her brother Jason Lyles in 2003, 
they ended up having to put up a baby casket since they were unable to get all of her remains. For twenty years you live with this wondering what went wrong. Though I doubt I'll ever be able to move on from this, I believe it would settle a lot better if the guy would say, yeah, I did it. Tammy was a 16-year-old girl whose life came to an abrupt end in 1983. She resided in Everett, Washington. On June 9, 1983, she went missing from downtown Seattle, Washington. Patricia Cole Tyndall, the sheriff for King County, stated in 2023 that Tammy's family refuses to engage with the media. She mentioned, We appreciate your support in giving the family the privacy they seek during this time. This breakthrough in the case came when 15-year-old Lori Ann Razpotnik emerged as yet another victim of Ridgeways. On November 13, 1967, Lori was born in Juneau, Alaska. She went missing in 1982 following an altercation with her mother. She wanted a horse. A friend had one. Telling her mother that all she needed to do was pay for the feed and stall's rent, to which her mother responded as, No. She didn't have the time or the money. A decade before, her husband had died. Raising two teens on her own, she was a single mother. It was impractical. For over 40 years, Laurie's disappearance remained a mystery, an open wound, and an excruciating phantom limb until her remains were found and identified as one of at least 49 victims. Donna, who was 76 years old at the time, has been haunted by Lori's disappearance, absence, and passing all this time. About Lori's identification, Donna remarked, I guess everybody calls it closure, but to me it was just a relief. Everything that might have happened? How come? Where has she been? All of the questions that comes to your mind. You give up trying to convince yourself into believing she is still alive, raising a family, and everything is okay. The fact that everything is off your mind and shoulders is simply relief. A part of me as a mother was still in denial. You build a wall around these things, she stated. The difficult part is that those walls begin to fall apart. She said that Lori was a firecracker, interested in everything, sports, the outdoors, horses, dogs, and cooking. She played baseball and ran track. She liked a snowmobile. When she was seven years old, she trained Ebony's Flippy Miss, the family Labrador retriever known as Flip, and competed with her in a dog show. Donna says that she didn't even need to open her books to score an A. After her disappearance, she did have one conversation with her daughter. Either 1982 or 83, it was Thanksgiving. The family was gathering at Lori's grandparents' house, which she called. She informed them that Christmas gifts would be coming their way. She mentioned how delighted she was in her new home in Seattle. On December 30, 1985, approximately three years after Lori ran away from her house, her remains were located and listed as Bone 17. Cece Moore, chief genetic genealogist at Parabon Nanolabs, performed the genetic genealogical research. She attempts to construct a family tree or a lineage for the unidentified person by employing partial matches from numerous generations and family trees, much like a detective might. She knew she was searching for a teenage girl, however there wasn't much evidence Lori had left. When she vanished, she was quite young. She vanished before the internet, social media, and online people searches was a thing. She hadn't ever voted or purchased any property or paid taxes. Moore combed through yearbook pictures, birth announcements, and census records, but she found nothing. Then she landed on an obituary, one paragraph on page 62 of the Seattle Times, published on January 19, 1972. Razpotnik William S. of Juneau, Alaska, formerly of Seattle. Husband of Donna, father of William George and Lori Ann. She was aware of Donna as well as Lori's brother, William George. Over a year after Moore began her search and over four decades after Lori vanished, Donna Hurley received a knock on her door by two detectives who had responded to a report she had written and submitted to King County. Donna's DNA was compared to a saliva sample to confirm her identity. 
In the 1980s, Donna moved to Juneau, Alaska from Centralia, Pennsylvania. There were better career opportunities and her parents also resided there. She spent a decade in the hotel business, 13 years working in a veterinarian's office, followed by a year employed by the Alaska Department of Education. Currently retired, she has two grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. They are Lori's great and great-great nieces and nephews, despite having never met her. Like her dad, Lori's brother too died of cancer in 2010. Throughout the years, Donna watched news reports about the Green River Killer. She gave it some thought every now and again. She added, We were so far away. We were in Alaska. I was still raising my son. I was trying to push all of it out of my mind. Police would upload images and sketches of the victims on social media. She said, I never saw anyone that I believed looked like Lori. Police released a composite photograph of Bone 17 that they believed would represent her genetic makeup. Blonde hair, blue-green eyes, and fair complexion. Donna remarked, It took me a long time to admit that it resembled her. She thought to herself that Lori had curly hair, but the composite image had straight hair. It was mostly denial. There comes a point when you become numb. It's just... She paused, trying to find the right words. Her life ending in that way saddens me. I'm angry at whoever did it, and at myself for not being able to stop it. And eventually... You just have to come to terms with the fact that you have another member of your family that you have to keep going forward for. Donna remarked that Lori's father was her idol. She believes Lori never fully recovered from his death when she was just five years old. She was daddy's little girl. She had big blue eyes and curled ponytails. She intends to bury Lori alongside her father in Seattle's Evergreen Washelli Cemetery. Despite the identification of the last known remains in the medical examiner's office, Dave Reichert of the King County Sheriff's Office stated that there are still unresolved cases. According to Ridgway, he unalived 6570 young women and young girls. To date, he has admitted culpability in 49 slayings, and 51 cases have been closed. So as I mentioned earlier, there are other cold cases that might or might not have any connection with Ridgway, but there are still parents out there searching for information on the whereabouts of their daughters. On April 21, 2023, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State approved legislation removing execution from the state's law. If Ridgway was to be found guilty of any further slayings outside of Washington State, the King County Prosecutor's Office states that he may still be executed. After more than three decades of suffering and ambiguity, Tamika Reyes finally has the answer to who murdered her mom. She lost her mother at the age of just nine years. On 23rd of October, 1988, the body of Anna Kane, then 26 years old, with bailing twine wrapped around her neck, was discovered in a forested area close to Reading, Pennsylvania. An inquiry suggested that she had been strangled somewhere else, and then her body was discarded in the forest. About 15 months following Kane's death, in February 1990, the Reading Eagle, a local newspaper, published a front-page article asking for information regarding her killing. Then, an anonymous letter from a concerned citizen offering details, which, as per the authorities, only the murderer could have known was received by the newspaper. Moreover, the letter writer left behind his DNA over the envelope after licking it. The DNA from the saliva gave a match with that discovered on Kane's clothes, stated authorities in 2022. However, decades passed, while the police remained unsure of the identity of the suspect. Ultimately, the killer was identified in 2022 by Pennsylvania State Police using genetic genealogical analysis. At a press conference, Law enforcement officials named the assailant as Scott Grimm, a local man. Reyes is relieved to have some answers at last, while she laments the loss of her grandmother, who passed away before the case could be solved. When I found out, I felt a little bit of everything, she said. I was both relieved to finally see the monster who had stolen her from us, 
and disappointed that he would never have to deal with the repercussions. Reyes, her two brothers, and their grandmother have been wondering for 34 years who took Cain's life. The lack of closure has added to the grief of losing their mom, she said. Then, in August 2022, an investigator called Reyes to inform him of a startling development in the case. After decades of hoping for justice, she felt some relief. The killer of her mother had been finally revealed by the investigators. However, she was devastated to find out that Grimm had passed away from natural causes at the age of 58 years and would not pay for depriving her and her siblings of a mother's love and guidance. Reyes was just nine years old when her mother was slain, and she says every day, ever since she thinks about her mom. She was an absolute firecracker, very gregarious, afraid of nothing, very honest, straightforward, and compassionate. Reyes recalled about her favorite childhood memories, the walks with her mother while watching her randomly dance to any song that happened to be playing in the stores as they went by. Reyes was raised by her aunt following her mother's death, and her two brothers moved in with their father. Reyes stated that the portrayal of her mom, who was jobless at the time of her passing, in the media really bothers her. Despite her troubled past, which included drug abuse and prostitution, her mother was making an effort to change her ways. The description of her as a deceased sex worker was unpleasant, according to Reyes, then 43 years old, of Len Hartsville, Pennsylvania, as if she deserved what happened to her. That wasn't all that she was. She fell victim to someone. She was a mother. She had people who loved her. No one deserves what happened to her. To solve the case, investigators employed the latest technologies. Using genetic genealogy, which encompasses evidence from DNA and conventional genealogy to uncover familial links between people, investigators claim to have identified Grimm as the perpetrator. Over the past few years, companies that offer genealogical research services, such as 23andMe and Ancestry, have been encouraging people to provide their saliva sample and send it out for examination. These companies then provide the users with a raw DNA data file along with family tree information, hereditary medical conditions, and details about their racial history. Millions of people are trying to learn about their ancestral roots, and as a result, the practice has grown significantly. It has now evolved into an advantageous asset for the authorities investigating cold cases. It is now possible to upload DNA collected from the crime scenes to an online database that compares it to DNA provided by the individuals who use 23andMe and other companies to look up their ancestry. Genealogists can create family trees if a match is discovered, which can assist law enforcement in identifying prospective suspects. When investigators examined Kane's clothes, they discovered traces of DNA from an unknown male. Eventually, they confirmed that it matched the DNA found on the 1990 envelope, which supported the detective's suspicion that the writer of the letter was the actual murderer. Grimm had never been arrested for a crime that required his DNA to be entered into the database, so even though the detectives possessed his DNA profile, they had nothing to work with to identify him, said the authorities. This is where genetic genealogy comes in. The state of preservation of crime scene DNA, whether it had degraded or not, determines the degree of effectiveness of genetic genealogy in cold cases. At a press conference in 2020, state police trooper Daniel Wummer stated that the detective's meticulous preservation of DNA evidence in 1988 laid a strong basis for the present-day detectives to utilize modern technology for investigation. Sergeant Nathan Trait of the Pennsylvania State Police stated that everything had been kept as it should have been because they anticipated that at some point in the future, whatever they had gathered would turn out to be the crucial piece of evidence needed to crack the case. Now that it is 2022, that small piece of evidence they had obtained then was precisely what we needed. Reyes still has unanswered questions for the person who took her mother's life. Grimm's only known detail by investigators is that he resided in the neighboring town of Hamburg in Pennsylvania. 
They are trying to find out if he knew Cain, and they've requested anyone who is aware of their connection to get in contact. Although there haven't been any associations discovered thus far, Wimmer highlighted that this doesn't rule out the possibility of one. At the time of her death, Cain was allegedly working as a sex worker and might have been seeing a client, according to Wimmer. Taking that into account, investigators are trying to figure out if it was grim. The 1990 letter has not been made public by the Pennsylvania State Police, nor have they provided further details regarding its contents. There was just intimate details about where she had been disposed of, how her clothes were displayed, stuff like that, Wimmer stated. Because of this, detectives came to the conclusion that the letter's writer was the one responsible for the killing. The biggest breakthrough in the case took place when they got a new sample of Grimm's DNA to compare with the previous evidence. They refused to go into detail about how they got his DNA, since he had passed away four years ago. According to Trait, it was legally collected via a search warrant. Now that we have identified Grimm's DNA, the authorities will be going through other unsolved cold cases to determine whether he was involved or not, said Wimmer. In the meantime, Reyes continues to miss her mom. She claimed that growing up without a mother had been tough. No child should ever have to grow up without their mother. Reyes still has a lot of questions that she would ask Grimm if he were to be alive today. Why would he murder a young woman merely wanting to provide for her children? And when he found out she had a family that loved her, what went through his mind? Reyes is relieved that her family now knows who killed her mother, even though she is aware she won't ever get those answers. A peaceful neighborhood in Clarksville, Tennessee was shattered when elderly couple William and Rena Campbell were found dead in their home in 2010. The investigation took a surprising turn years later, when their adopted son was arrested in connection with the crime. But what led to this tragic outcome? Join us as we unravel the mystery behind the Campbell case. What secrets lurked behind the closed doors of the Campbell residence? And how did a seemingly ordinary family tragedy become a chilling tale of greed and betrayal? William and Ina Campbell resided in a house at Jackson Road in Clarksville, Tennessee. Both of them were in their 80s and living happy lives. On January 29, 2010, Daniel Champagne, the Campbell's neighbor, made several attempts to reach them. They treated Daniel like a son, and he described them as his second parents. Likewise, he had a key to their home, so when he called and got no response, he went inside. Upon entering, he discovered that the house had been broken into. Every cabinet in the kitchen was opened. Then Daniel stumbled upon something dreadful. He discovered lifeless bodies of Ina and William, both with gunshot wounds to their head in their bedrooms. They suffered from health issues and used to sleep in different beds. When he initially discovered Ina, she still had an oxygen tube in her nose. Their deaths were concluded to have occurred while they were asleep. Investigators were informed by neighbors that this is strange, since if an intruder had broken in and woken the Campbell family, their dogs would have barked. It made investigators consider that the perpetrator was familiar with both the couple and their dogs. Subsequently, William Roger Campbell, their adopted son, became an individual of interest. It was presumed that the crime would benefit him financially. Nevertheless, there was no tangible proof that he killed his parents, and the case became cold. Following that, on June 21, 2021, William Roger Campbell was apprehended at his residence in relation to the crime and transported to Clarksville. He was brought to the Montgomery County Jail. Investigators didn't immediately provide an explanation for why he was arrested, albeit his presence doesn't help with the case. These were innocent lives. These were people who were adored by their community, stated Detective Keenan Carlton. They've been in the neighborhood for a while now. Their neighbors loved them and they're all relieved now to see some closure. Keenan credited detectives who handled the case a decade ago for setting the foundation for the investigation. A recent evaluation of the case, according to Keenan, 
allowed detectives to fit the last piece of the puzzle together to solve the mystery, thereby arresting Campbell. January 2023 marked the start of his trial. During the trial, it was brought out how Campbell gained monetarily from the crime. The combined estates of Bill Campbell and his wife Ina were estimated to exceed $130,000 and $120,000, respectively. Roger Campbell was the only heir and received $180,000 in total from his parents' inheritance. It was also made public that he left the crime scene about 40 minutes after Bill and Ina were reportedly killed, stated investigators. Likewise, it was also mentioned how the dogs didn't bark, along with the fact that all of the personal belongings remained untouched. No one had interfered with the locked boxes. Jewelry boxes seemed as it is. Around $2,800 in cash was still there. Surprisingly enough, all of the firearms as well as the checks were still on the dining room table. Campbell's son, Sean, said he had a tight bond with his deceased grandparents but rarely remembers seeing his father as a child. Sean Campbell remarked, In the 35 years that I've been on this planet, I've spent less than 24 hours around him. Following the memorial service for Bill and Ina Campbell, Sean Campbell learned of an estate auction held at the Campbell home. He claims that his father never asked him to save any of his grandparents' belongings as mementos. Linda Campbell, the former spouse of Campbell and Sean's mother, also provided a testimony. At the time, she was employed at the commissary. Three days prior to the body's discovery on January 26, 2010, Linda was paged to register 17. There, she was taken aback to encounter Campbell along with his mother, Ina. It had been over 13 years since she'd last seen or spoken to him. After striking up a conversation, Campbell informed her that he was just in town traveling and would be departing on 28th. Linda Campbell remarked, I thought, why should I care when you're leaving? Until then, she had never heard a word from Ina, William, or Roger. It looked like Campbell was trying to conjure up an alibi. 2010 saw a thorough search of the crime scene by CPD drug agent and crime scene investigator, Agent Frederick McClintock, who reported discovering a Palmolive's dish soap bottle with a reddish-brown residue, resembling like blood, on its back end. A field test swab revealed that the substance contained blood. Later, DNA testing revealed that this blood belonged to Roger Campbell. Andrew Smith of It's Time Clock and Jewelry Company testified that Bill and Ina Campbell possessed an antique Lenskirk grandfather clock which was unique. Smith had a degree in horology, the study of time and its measurements. He has been making yearly maintenance visits to the Campbell residence whilst servicing the grandfather clock since a long time. When he saw that clock for the first time, he made Bill Campbell an offer of $5,000 for it, and Roger Campbell was also there, Smith added. Bill declined, stating that he was unwilling to part with the clock, although he was already aware of its rarity and antique status. Less than a month after Bill and Ina's deaths, in February 2010, Smith got a call asking if he was still interested in purchasing the Lenskirk grandfather clock. Smith told the court he was delighted to be able to purchase the clock at last. Upon reaching the Campbell home, though, he was greeted by Roger Campbell, instead of his typical clientele. I asked, where are your parents? Smith said to the judge. Haven't you heard? He asked, while seeming anxious and uncomfortable. Mother and father were shot in their bedrooms. Smith said that he attempted to halt the deal right away, but Campbell maintained that he was the only heir and was in charge of the estate. When Smith chose to proceed with the deal, he said that Roger Campbell attempted to bargain by requesting an additional thousand dollars. Following around four hours of jury's discussion on January 23, 2023, 66-year-old Roger Campbell was convicted guilty of killing his parents. He's currently awaiting his sentence. As the trial concluded, the truth behind the chilling tale of the Campbell case emerged. Roger Campbell's conviction shed light on the greed and betrayal that tainted the once serene neighborhood. But amidst the closure, lingering questions remain. 
What drove Roger Campbell to commit such a heinous act against his own parents? And what other secrets might still be hidden within the walls of the Campbell residence? As we reflect on this harrowing tale, we invite you to share your thoughts and theories in the comments below. What do you believe truly happened on that fateful day in 2010? And what lessons can we learn from this tragic story? Join the conversation and let's continue to unravel the mystery together. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of cold cases.